So hey there fellow YouTubers, it's Frank Bush here again. I'm just hiking down a old uh, decommissioned logging road. That uh, gives easy access to areas of woods that normally would be difficult for me to get into. I'm lucky in that regard, the area I'm in, there was a lot of active logging back in the 70s and 80s and that's kind of tapered off a bit. So they've decommissioned the roads and kind of put potholes in them, you know, big ones to make sure cars can't get in, that kind of stuff. But it makes it easy to kind of move around in this terrain. So I'm just uh, scouting out for a location. I know there's a river slash creek that's about a kilometer away. I'm trying to get close to that location. That way I've got easy access to water, but stay tuned. We'll have lots of good stuff in this video. So yeah, here's an example of, you know, where the logging companies have kind of come through with an excavator or whatever and just dug trenches and set them into the road so it's unfit to drive through, but the road keeps going. It'll probably go for another couple kilometers in through the bush. Just like I say, it makes it easy shortcut for me to get around. If you kind of look at the terrain that I'm in, this is quote unquote level terrain, but if you're hiking with a 40, 50 pound bag, some of the stuff can get difficult to kind of trudge through. There's a lot of deadfall and that kind of stuff in the area. So this is just kind of a way for me to get in and out of these areas easier. But, uh, you know, like I say, these roads have been decommissioned for a couple of years now. Uh, and it splits off and goes in various directions. You know, that goes that way, this one goes that way. Gives me lots of areas where I can get access to different different places I can film in so you guys see different scenery and that kind of thing. But either way, I'll uh, kind of keep pushing on. A few things I'll probably show as I hike down my trail and uh, catch that and then we'll get into the actual bushcraft stuff. So here's one of the things I, I don't mind showing. This is the uh, primrose plant. So these aren't in the best shape, so you now the bugs look like they've already gotten to them half decent. But uh, you can tell the look of them, they're, they're kind of really crinkly looking. On the underside they're a lighter color than on the top. But the entire plant is edible. These are fairly abundant in the location I'm in. The root system of these plants is quite extensive. They spread out and they're almost like a spaghetti noodle, if you will. This plant is a top tier survival food. You know, hundreds of calories in a, in a large plant like this. You know, and they definitely uh, give you the carbs and that type of stuff you need. So there's a couple of them. Like I say, these are kind of poor examples. You know, they've got the bugs got into them. There's some younger ones over here. These ones are, you know, just starting to come. They're a little brighter green. They're tastier when they're small, but you don't get quite the meal out of them. But you can see the bugs are getting to these. If I come across ones that uh, don't look like they've had the bugs ravage them and that kind of stuff, I'll try to get that on camera. But uh, yeah, there's lots of them in this area, so I, I wouldn't be surprised if I don't stumble upon a half decent one as we go. But like I say, definitely top tier survival foods. They're out for the better part of the year. Kind of give you a close-up of them, other than the bugs have gotten to them. Just to give you an idea of the look and feel of them. Just throw them in a the pot, boil them up. You can say the roots make kind of a great noodle alternative, if you will. But definitely, definitely lots of calories and good survival food there. So I've made teas in previous videos out of this tree, but this is a, a white cedar. But uh, you just pull off the sprigs and throw them in a pot and boil them like you would pine tea. So actually I prefer the flavor of the cedar tea over the pine. And there's lots of white cedars growing all through the area I'm in. There's no, you know, another one growing back there a bit. Hopefully I'm catching that on the camera, but there's another one growing back. They're all through this area. I'm actually looking for the red cedar more than the white. Uh, you know, the white's good for supplying you know, these to kind of make tea out of and stuff. But the red cedar, the outer bark of the red cedar tree, you just shave with a rock and you can give you some fine tinder. So if I stumble upon one of those, I'll harvest some of the resources. But either way, just kind of carry on with the hike. So here's more of the classic excavated gouging I was talking about. Kind of cut off the head points to get in and out of these areas. It's all right though, when you're by foot, it's easy enough to get around. We're getting close to the river and stuff. I'll go down and take some scenes of it and then I'll come back up. I want to set up in the woods down here, I think. But you can see it gets pretty dark in these woods though. That's, that's definitely thick. So I'll just push on. I'll take another couple scenes and then I'll get into my camp. So here's a prime primrose specimen. 
This thing's a fairly substantial size. I mean, to give you an idea, that's the size of my hand. That's a, that's definitely a full meal within itself. And there's a, another one in the bushes back there. There's a couple of them back there. Let's see. There's another one here. It's not quite as nice. It looks like there's two or so, there, maybe one. Like I say, this one's probably the nicest specimen here though. Yep. Easily, easily a meal. Like I say, fairly easy to identify. You don't see too many leaves that kind of have that look and shape to them. They also make a great toilet paper if you're really needing toilet paper. But uh, one way or the other, the entire plant's edible. Like you say, just boil in the pot, the roots, everything. There, it's a, a definitely a couple hundred calories in a full plant that size. Yeah, we're getting close to the river now. The sun's finally come out. Enjoy your joys. It's been raining in the area I'm in for the last couple days, so everything was pretty wet. Last night, maybe yesterday around dinner time, it stopped raining in this area. Things have started to dry out. Now well, I can see some, looks like some sort of track. Can't fully identify that one yet, but you're gonna see a lot more animal tracks than people tracks in this location. So, I'm just kind of, oh yeah, here we go. I don't know what that is, but almost looks like wolf or cougar. I always have a hard time telling the difference between the two. When the tracks get murky and they're a little bit old, they look very, very similar. But, oh. And the, Elk have been moving through this area. Lots of well-defined tracks through here. So they must come down here for their water supply. Let's see if I can find any more. Yeah, there's... Let's see if I can catch that in the shadows in the sun, if you will. Those are pretty well-defined. It looks like a fair-sized elk, too. But, give you an idea of the size of these tracks. There's my hand in comparison to the size. So, you know, it's not a huge elk, but fair size nonetheless. They're leaving good depth in the soil, so. Yeah, I think they come down here for the water supply. There's quite a few of the tracks. You say, I haven't really seen any human tracks per se other than my own. <laughs> but, I'm gonna give a 360 just to show you the area. I don't even know the name of this river. It's not on any of the maps that I have that doesn't show what it is, but I just knew it was here from stumbling through the woods a few times in the past. So I'll see if I can find a half decent spot to do a scenic shot of the river and then I'll switch back to heading back up to the camp. Well, this really is a fly fisherman's paradise. There's uh, lots of breaks and different arms in the uh, creek slash river here. There's one runs that way. One comes in here, there's a little off eddy on this side. There are lots of calm pockets that sit here and over here where fly fishing would just be ideal. I really wish I had my fly rod at this point in time, but say la vie. So I'm going to cut scenes. I'll uh, go back and start setting up the camp. I'll kind of get the bushcraft part of this bushcraft video going. This is pretty well the area that I want to set up camp in. It looks fairly dark as I'm coming into it. I'm going to have to stop and review the scene that I'm cutting as I speak and just take a peek to see how dark it is. This area looks fairly shaded. I mean, the forest I'm in is extremely thick. I don't know if the camera is giving it justice or not, but there's not much sunshine poking through. So under that premise, I, even though I like this area, see there's a nice little clear patch here. I might not film in this specific zone just because I want better lighting. I know this camera doesn't do well under, you know, adverse lighting conditions. But uh, I kind of like this little zone. But I think I'm going to go take a peek at another spot that's just down the road from where I'm at. And see if the lighting looks like it's better there, I'll shoot there. If it looks like it's better here, I'll shoot here. But one way or the other, we'll start to get the camp set up. The day's getting on now. It's getting close to 11 o'clock in the morning, so. I'm at the second location I was thinking about. It's a little closer to the main lines where the logging trucks and 
off-roaders and stuff go you know truck people but uh i kind of like this area a little better the sky opens up a little bit lets just a bit more light through into this location i've got to kind of hack to get through these fallen trees but my thinking really is it looks like a nice relatively level little patch of earth over there so i think if in that area is where i'm going to set up camp it might be a little better for me so I just wanted to show you guys something here. So this is a white cedar here. It produces the same kind of green foliage, you know, the flat green foliage as the red cedar, which is what this one is. Now it's just a larger tree, but you know, the white cedars get big too. It was just one right beside the other, so it's a good example. But I wanted to show you the white cedar bark in comparison to the red cedar bark. At first glance, they look fairly similar. But what you find is, when you take a stone and you scrape on the white cedar, you can produce shavings that are kind of fine and fluffy, but it's not as effective, it's not nearly as effective, coming off of the white cedar tree as it is off of the red cedar tree. That the red cedar tree really produces a far superior tinder bundle when you're trying to make a fire. It is possible off the white cedar. You know, I've gotten I've gotten the fluff that comes off the white cedar to, to take a spark and turn it into a flame and stuff, but it didn't last nearly as long. I don't I just don't think that the white cedar has quite the same type of volatile oils or whatever it is inside them that the red does. So when you're looking to harvest cedar to use as a tinder fluff by shaving the the outside bark with a sharp stone or the back of your knife, um, definitely go with the red cedar instead. So I'm going to do that and then I'll show you an example of, of that. So like I say, I've just got a stone that's got kind of a sharp edge on it. And I've already done a little tiny bit there, but I'll do it some more. Love. So what you just kind of I'll try to do this without getting my hand in the way. So you just kind of rub the stone, the sharp edge of it, against the cedar. This is the white one now. You rub it against the cedar and kind of produce a little pile. And for the amount of area that I kind of killed on this tree, it produces a very small amount of cedar fluff. I don't know if the camera's going to get that, but... It didn't produce very much you know and even if the white cedar even if this white cedar was a larger diameter the bark is way thinner on the white cedar and just doesn't produce quite the volume of fluff and when I let me just pull out a lighter I'll switch camera angles and show it to you so like I say this is that white cedar fluff I've only got a little tiny bit of it and I'll just apply a flame to it so it holds a flame and it'll take it, but it won't hold it for very long. And it just wants to kind of self-extinguish. Even with the fine tinder, it doesn't hold that flame for a very long period of time and wants to just go out. As you can see, it just didn't sustain the flame. If, the, if it's the really, really fine tinder, it will take a flame, but it won't hold it for very long. And it just self-extinguishes. And then I'll show you that in comparison with the red cedar. So now I'll try to cut my hand. Normally I just cut my hand underneath it and catch it, but I, I don't want my hand to get in the way of the camera. So, as you can see, producing, without getting down to the heart of the actual tree itself and causing damage to any you know, significant degree, I'm actually producing a half decent amount of this tinder fluff. Hopefully the camera's getting that all right producing a half decent amount of this tinder fluff almost immediately so i'll shift camera angles and i'll show you how this ignites then okay so just shifted my camera angle now now i'll just light up this red cedar you can see i shaved about the same area tree but the actual end results was just a lot more tinder fluff and when i light it that tinder fluff holds a flame to the degree where i had to drop it because it just keeps going and it just keeps burning and burning until it's gone pretty well as long as it's you know got air moving through it it's it's far more difficult i'll just put that all out it's far more difficult to get that um, white cedar ignited and sustaining the flame so when you're harvesting cedar as a tinder bundle i highly recommend using the red cedar it's far more effective after about 30 seconds or so i harvested you know a handful size pile 
if you're not super proficient at using red cedar bark to make your fires as your kind of tinder source or your you might want to go with a pile that would be the size of two hands full you know this is a small pile and I just got a, a few of the bark pieces that I've added to it and really I've gone with a small pile here I, I trust my own abilities in making a fire with a small amount of tinder just with the background experience I have but if you're not you know proficient at doing the fires and it's not just kind of second nature to you go with a bundle like I say that's probably the size of two cupped hands full and that way your chances of kind of getting this fire going are a lot higher with a solid tinder but I've got some other tricks I want to show when we go to do the fire so but I just wanted to show you the differences between the white cedar and the red cedar you know even if you harvest them and they look the same the performance of the red cedar is far superior so when you're out in the field I recommend using the red cedar as your tinder choice if those are the options available to you well let's get to it shall we Yeah, this spot looks fairly level. Good clean little area. That might even be a little better over on the other side. I didn't even push in that far. Yeah. Nice little zone right here. Couldn't ask her better. So I'm gonna hang out my bag and we'll start to get this going. What do I spy with my little eye? Little lizard. It's the only tiny one, but pretty cool. So I decided to come back over to the other side of the second log that I had hopped over. There was just too much human garbage sitting over there. After looking around for a minute, I saw just debris everywhere, so I decided that that might not be the best option for me. Yeah, it really is unfortunate that when humans come out here, they just litter garbage everywhere. Something I'm pretty adamantly against because the next people coming through, I don't want to have to turn around and fill up, uh, you know, a car load of garbage just because they can't figure out how to keep it together. And I've done that hundreds of times. And it seems like there is no such thing as a remote area much anymore. Almost anywhere I go. You know, you might be under the illusion that, oh, you're one of the first people ever been there. That's just simply not the case. Unless you're in some very, very far away from city place. You know, 99% of the time, if you're within even 100 miles, 200 kilometers or so, give or take, of an urban center, even a small one, you're going to find armies of garbage. It's just the nature of things. It's really a... Uh, one of the tragedies that I've seen from doing bushcraft stuff. There's only a few places that I've ever been on the planet where it hasn't just been riddled with garbage yet. So either way, bags up, hanging. I'm just gonna stop, catch my breath, kind of figure out exactly how I'm gonna lay out my camp and start moving on to the next scene. So these uh, deadfalls that are in the area have lots of straight sticks coming off them. I'm just gonna harvest off three six foot length ones and uh, lash together a tripod as I normally do in my videos just to get my camera up and that way I can start setting up scenes and doing things with the camera on a tripod instead. So when I say straight stick, straight is a relative term when you're in the woods. You know, quite often anything you find is going to have a bit of a bow to it and that kind of stuff. But I'm not overly concerned. I don't need them super straight. This is really just a small lightweight tripod to get my camera up. So, you know, nothing too complex. Just make sure I get the big pieces off. But as you can see, you know, if I wanted straighter sticks, there is ones that I could harvest off the other trees, but half of them are alive. And I'm not one to turn around and kill things unnecessarily. You know, these, uh, these resources will be adequate to hold up the, you know, what, three or four ounce camera, whatever the weight of the camera is, you know. If I was worried about holding up my cooking pot and that kind of stuff, I'd want to use a stronger tripod, and I'll probably end up having to do that later. But I see another, the 
first fallen tree that I popped over coming in here, it also had it also had some um, straighter sticks than these. But uh, either way, just got to get the resources together to get my tripod together. So I think this area right out in front here. I think this is probably one of the more level patches. I've uh, there was some. Uh, vines that were growing that had some prickles on them and stuff. I just kind of kicked them out of the way. But uh, I think this is really where I'm going to be setting up my base camp. Okay, so I just got to get my tarp and my tent bags out now. Uh, for years I used to make my own tent pegs, but as I've gone through time, I just find Having to stop and make tent pegs, just time consuming. So I packed these long, I know it's a laziness thing. I packed these long, not essential. You could go without them and just do your own off the field. But to save time for the videos and that type of stuff, I've decided to go with them. So in my bag, I've got my standard 10 by 10 AquaQuest tarp that I use. And the tent pegs, I'll be going down onto the ground this time. Okay, so for this tarp configuration, you have to start off with the tarp facing the ground. So I'll just get my tarp out here. Like I say, this is a 10 foot by 10 foot or a 3 meter by 3 meter square tarp. So with a lot of the higher grade tarps, you don't see it on the blue ones as much, but there's a shiny side, and there's a dull side. I want the shiny side facing upward. I'm just gonna set that relatively flat. It doesn't have to be perfect. And the thinking really is, I'm gonna tent peg out one corner to start with. Put a couple of them out. So I'll start with this kind of back corner here. I'll cut back. I've got to grab a rock just to pound that in. So the next step, I'm going to want to take the center on the opposite side. I'm going to want to peg that in. But when I go to peg that in, I want to kind of, because this is going to be my entrance here. So I want to determine where I want that to face out to before I go pegging it in. So I'll probably set it about there. Just grab my good pegs. I'm going to just turn around and stick a tent bag through, pull it tight, and pound it down. So for the next part of putting the shelter together, I need a six to seven foot length straight stout stick. So uh, these deadfalls have a fair bit of curve to them and the strength of them is fairly compromised because of the age that they've been sitting dead. So potentially I'm just gonna go harvest off a small like maple sapling or something. They tend to grow pretty straight. So I'm just gonna kind of scout around this area and see if I can find something that would get choked out either way and harvest that off. And that way I've got a good strong straight stick. I've harvested off a maple sapling. I knew it was gonna get choked out. It was just growing too close to the, uh, I think there's spruce trees in there. But, uh, yeah, it was just growing too close to the spruce tree. This thing had never become a full maple, and they just wouldn't get to that point. But, uh, needless to say, it's a good stout stick, even though the diameter of it is fairly small. Uh, and I hate using green. Don't get me wrong, I really do. But, uh, I know the deadfall that are around here have been there for a long time. So they just don't have the structural integrity that I'm going to need. So either way, I've got my maple stick. I'll just leave that there for a second. Now the thinking really was... So we peg down the one in the back corner to on this side in the center 
Now I'm going to come over to this side and I'm going to take the center tie-out point that I have and that's going to come over this way. And I'm going to end up having that hooked on to the maple stick and then tied down so I'll cut angles and set up the ropes and that way I can kind of get this tied off and stuff and show you details as I go of exactly how I pull that off. Okay, so I had a tie out that was already tied on there that I had to just take off. And I've grabbed another loop of rope like I normally would use, my standard 28 inch length loops. So I'm just going to feed that loop through, just grab it and pull it back on itself. And that way it's tied on. That makes a lark's head knot onto that tie out point. And now with the stick, I'm going to do a similar kind of thing. I'm going to bring the knot over on itself and I'm going to put the end over the maple stick as such. Now the thinking really is I want that large head knot on the maple stick to be up the pole high enough where from the halfway point where it's tied off down it touches up to the tie out point on the ground so I've got both tie out points that I'm able to tie out together. Now all I've got to do is get my guy line attached onto this pole and run it out to the ground. Okay so just to show you that again I'll try to do this up close as best I can. So I've got this tie out I've got the 28 inch length of loop, you know, it's a 28 inch length of cordage. I just tied together with a fisherman's knot and it forms a loop. I just feed that through the tie out point. I just grab the end, open it up, hook it and pull it back through and that way I'm cinched onto that tie out point. And now I do a similar kind of thing for hooking onto the maple. I take the other end of this loop I just kind of open it up with my fingers, I reach in, I grab it, and kind of open up a pocket. It allows me to set on that maple stick and cinch it down. Now potentially, this stick, uh, the, the lark's head knot that I just formed on there, potentially that's going to want to slide down the stick from tension. So in order to alleviate that, I'm just going to do a little saw mark along here where every couple inches just little ones so it's got something to bite into if it does want to slip because this maple stick is slippery so it wants to kind of give easier so in order to help stop that if i put in a few little saw marks it'll stop that problem okay so like i say i've now put in just some saw marks every about inch long and i did that not the whole length of the pole but just enough where if i need to adjust it when it's up now you can see, as I go to slide down, it gets caught in those little cut-ins and doesn't want to slide as much, whereas before, with the maple being smooth, it would just slide freely. So that just helps alleviate that problem. So this is the end that's going to go up in the air. Okay, so I'm going to preemptively show how I attach my guy lines to this pole. Um, just so I don't have to do it twice. So if I do it down here close to the camera, you guys can see it in detail first off. So the thinking really is, and if you've watched previous videos of mine, I have kind of little hanks of rope that are six, eight foot in length. You know, anywhere in between those, they vary. I'll just unravel it, hold on. It has a loop tied in the one end, and then, like I said, runs for six to eight foot. And then I hook a prussic loop on it to give it an adjustability for guy line tie-outs. So I use these in tons, pretty well every one of my videos. So if you've ever seen any previous videos, you'll see these used all the time. But the thinking really is, I'll just go back to the end with the loop on it. All I'm going to do is hook that around that pole and feed it through itself. Just so it cinches onto that pole nice and solid. Make sure I get the knot through. And of course, down by the thick end, it's harder. I'll slide it up the pole further because I need it up there anyways. Just to make sure that that, just to make sure that that's on there good and firm. 
So now where I had those saw lines, right up underneath where I've attached it to the midway point, which I just showed, is where I'm going to kind of set that. And it's going to use those same saw notches to stop it from sliding down this pole. So I'm just going to set this all up and put uh, tension onto it and I'll show you when it's up. So you can see now, I've applied tension on the guy line to just kind of brace things down. Of course the wind's got to pick right up when you're doing this, right? <laughs> but this green sapling, I was a little concerned given the diameter of it, but it has a bit of bowing to it. So what'll end up happening is where the tie-out point is here, I'll end up taking that green sapling and tying it right up to that tie-out point and that way I'm ensuring that uh, any weakness exists within the stick is, uh, you help alleviate. But right now I just wanted to show you that yeah, the Marlin, or sorry, the uh, Lark's Head Knot is holding taut onto the maple and so is the guy line which is running out to the ground. It's so now on the ground section. If you remember in the early on, I'll just push this back so you can see it better. We had peg down this kind of triangle to the ground I've now taken the what now becomes a wall and taken the tie-out point and strapped it to the tie-out point that was on the corner so both of them come together and then the tension applies and forms a taut door and allows the top of the tarp to start to become tense so like I say, I'm a little concerned about the diameter of this maple. It's a little thinner than I wanted it to be, but when you're out in survival situations or bushcraft wilderness situations, uh, the resources you have are what you have. You know, it's difficult for me to find a stick that would be a little better suited than this. So I'll just make do with what it is. But I'll compensate, like I say, by lashing it to the tie-out point, And that way the bowing is as little as possible. The thinking then really is, this other piece can either, in really rough weather, you can bring this down and tie it out to that same tie-out point and lock everything so you have an enclosed shelter, or you can tie it out as such so you have kind of an open door entrance and you have a half ground sheet that exists inside the shelter. Okay, so and like I say, I had a bit of bowing going on with this maple because it just wasn't a big enough diameter so the tension that it's under is causing it to bow a little. So in order to help alleviate that I've got another one of my six to eight foot hanks of rope with the eyes in the end. I just wrap them up in quick release normally and uh, so the thinking really exact same kind of concept going on. I'm going to take that loop, hook it around, I'm going to feed it onto itself and pull the line through. And that way it's onto the pole exactly the same as the loop and the uh, guy line previously were. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to press this against the tie out point and I'm just going to wrap around both the tie out point and the pole. Just do basic lashing, nothing complex here. And that just helps ensure that the bowing isn't as hard on the maple. So now all I'm going to do is I'm going to put a loop into it as such, wrap the one side around, and I'm going to feed that back through itself and apply tension kind of locks it. I can quick release by pulling this side and just pull and in order to make sure that that stays kind of locked in place as a safety put a little tiny twig and just set that in. Lock it onto that and now this line I just set back over and it can become a drip line and it's just going to run down the back of the shelter so if it does rain which I'm not expecting it to but if it does it'll just help run the water away from the entrance. So if you knew the winds were getting really heavy and that kind of thing and you were concerned about this pull, the nature of these 10 by 10 tarps in one tie out from the corner, I could potentially loop and tie that part onto this pole as well. I'm just going to 
strap it as one and that way this whole line is lashed up to the support beam. I don't feel it's necessary given the weather I'm expecting but if it does turn bad later on in the uh, evening I'll end up doing exactly that just to ensure that everything stays rigid and firm. For a 10 by 10 shelter it's handy in the regards of this is probably one of the only closed door shelters I know you can do with a 10 by 10 without going into these pyramid shapes and that type of thing. You know, this still makes it high so you've got a lot of head and shoulder room inside the shelter. And like I say, you could lock that down. I could simply just hook it right onto the tent bag that's there. And I'm on, everything's closed. I could tie these two points off now easily enough, bind them right to that pole, and I'm as sealed as can be for a 10 by 10. <coughs> but still have the ability to squeeze in and out this entrance if I had to. But I'm not going to do that for this kind of scenario. Even though it's a little breezy and stuff, it's really the tail end of bad weather. So all I'm going to do is take this. I'm actually not even going to use just the tent peg. I'm going to use a tile point and tie this out so it's more of an open configuration. So I just wanted to show you. This is why... I like to tie on these prusik loops onto my guy lines. So the door is in an open configuration at this point in time. I can easily slide that prusik, remove the tension, and pop that off the tent peg all together. Switch it over, where I then just go off that tent peg, unlock it in, and I'm in a closed door. If I want to reverse that, easy enough, pop it out. I come back out to the tent peg that I got in the ground. I can even loosen off my prusik so it doesn't have tension at all to begin with. Set it on that tent peg, slide it up the line, apply my tension, and the door is open again. So it makes it very quick and easy to adjust how you've got your shelter. You know, if the weather turns really bad, I can easily lock down and get out of the elements. If I want it, if you know the weather stays warm like it is right now, and if I want it to stay airy and light in there, Easy enough. So I'll just stop here. The shelter's pretty well up. You know, it's not perfect. I'm not set up on level terrain, so things look a little tiny bit wonky, but all in all, I'm happy with the way it's set up. So I'll do a walk around to the shelter with the door open and then with the door closed, just to show you kind of both setups of this configuration. So one of the good parts about this is it allows you to dodge having a ground sheet to put your sleep bag on. I'll go this way even though there's a ditch and stuff. <laughs> and like I say, that's five foot wide at the head end. I could probably apply tension more to that corner, but that's five foot wide at the head end, you know, and 10 foot deep. So under that premise, you could easily set up your sleeping bag right on top of that and you don't have to worry about the moisture. The only thing is the cold of the earth is still going to get in. If you wanted to preempt that, you could turn around and put some ferns and that kind of stuff underneath this tarp when you were first setting it up and just give you kind of an insulated bed to begin with. I don't think I need that with the way the weather is at this point. But, and the sleeping bag I have is overrated for the temperatures it's going to be down to. So, but there's the open door configuration. And uh, like I say, the only unfortunate reality was that uh, maple should have really been a thicker piece of wood. But you know, life isn't perfect, right? But it gives you, definitely gives you the idea of exactly how to set this up and configure it. So I'll set this up in the closed door setup and then I'll uh, do a walk around to that and you can take a peek at that too. Well, like I say, that's the joy of these prosics. Remove the tension, slide it off the tent peg, switch it up, and I'm in closed door. So there really isn't a huge pile to see here. Like I say, when it comes to these tie outs where they square up to each other, you could easily set those together so that the doors were kind of locked right down and braced onto the pole. I really don't think it's necessary 99% of the time, but it is doable. I know there seems to be a little bit of a sloping to it, and that's primarily to do with the weakness of that maple ridge pole. But you can see it's a very small footprint. 
really a very simple setup to do. But it gives you a closed door tarp shelter with a 10 by 10 tarp. Big enough for one person and you can put your gear down by your feet. And if it was really bad weather, windy, wet weather, this would help keep you dry and out of that. You know, and if you were dealing with two or three people, I'd probably look at doing more of the uh, trapezoidal pyramid shelter that I've done in previous videos. That would be more ideal for that. It can house two, potentially three people, maybe even four, of, depending on the size of the people. Not. But I do like this setup for the additional headspace and that kind of thing. If I'm in there by myself, I can, you know, with the door open, I can set up my stool and kind of sit in under there and I don't have to bother setting up a tarp setup because my shelter acts as a quasi tarp. So if I turn around and, you know, the way I've configured this, I don't really have a huge pile of room to put the fire out here. But if I turn around and open up that door, I could have my stool sitting inside my shelter to keep me out of any potential rain and just have the fire sit right out front. It makes it really kind of compact and elegant for, uh, keeping me you know dry and and out of the elements without having to do multiple things you know set up multiple tarps and bridge lines and all that kind of stuff so as an added bonus i just thought i'd kind of stop and just show it from a you know a little bit of a distance away of if i wasn't using those bright orange guy lines which i really use mainly to have the camera pick things up better you could see that it's a very stealth setup if that was a cam uh, camo tarp you'd barely even know I was there. So it is one of the advantages to these kinds of setups. They are very low key, especially if you don't need to put tarps up in the air and that kind of stuff. You just set up a small stool inside the open door setup. You can be very covert, if you will. So just to show you, I went ahead and pulled out the sleeping bag and let it puff up and that kind of stuff, but threw it in there, put out the stool. You can see Easily enough room for that sleeping bag to sit there. And 100% sitting on the sheet, if you will. So you don't have to worry about moisture coming up from underneath and that kind of stuff. And one of the good parts, like I say, able to turn around and set up my stool. And this is a high stool. I think it's 55 centimeters, something like that. So I'll go ahead and cut angles here and sit in it. And you can see that if I was in a pinch and didn't need to put up any type of tarp above my head, in this video I don't think I'm going to because the weather is supposed to be full sun tomorrow and the next day, so I'm expecting it that uh, I won't need to worry about it. And given that the area I'm in is a bit of a clearing, there's nothing um, too worried about of overhead debris falling on me and that kind of stuff. So I'll sit on the stool and kind of show you of if I had the fire sitting out in this location, or in this location and just kind of shifted where my guy line was I could easily have it that I was tucked out inside my shelter sitting on the stool and just didn't really need to have a tarp so as you can see using a 10 by 10 tarp you can achieve having a shelter that you can close and open the door and it can also give you a bit of coverage so if there was incremental showers that were coming down and that kind of thing you know it allows you to kind of have a bit of coverage to stay out of those you know, this is great for people that like to go ultra light setup. They only want to have a single tarp. Normally I carry three or four. I don't find the weight to be a problem, really. I'd rather have the extra gear and carry the weight. But uh, some people like to go really ultra light and compact, you know, try to keep everything below 10 pounds and blah, 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 other than the food. But uh, this is uh, definitely a versatile shelter. It's not ideal if you're wanting to pack, you know, as many people as you can into it. But when it comes to comfort level, this shelter is quite good. So I was planning on doing a different kind of uh, fire setup again this time. But given the location that I've camped in is on this kind of logging, you know, old logging road that's been, you know, shut down. The ground here is really hard. It's really uh, grass and moss growing on top of a layer of rock. It was difficult to even get the tent pegs into the ground. So I'm going to switch back up to the tripod. But all is not lost. Uh, I'm not going to do the same stuff that I've done video after video. I'll show some, uh, some of the tricks I like to do when it comes to making the tinders and that kind of stuff. So right now I'm just going to kind of clear out a patch. Make sure I've got a safe area where I can kind of have my fire going and that type of thing. It's far enough away from the tent, that, in our, sorry, shelter, that I don't have to worry about uh, 
you know, I don't have to worry about pinhole burns and all that kind of stuff. So I'm just going to kind of prep this, get a tripod going. I'll probably cut back when I do the lashing of the tripod and show that up close for anybody that hasn't seen previous videos so that they can uh, be able to whip together tripods easily themselves. But like I say, I'm just going to kind of get my fire area ready and start to move into that kind of realm of the bushcraft stuff. So generally speaking, when you're out in thick forest areas like this, you definitely want to clear an area and get down to the dirt. And that way, when your fire is going, it doesn't start to ignite the foliage that's existing on the ground around you. So I normally clear off a circle area that's, I don't know, probably four or five foot wide, you know. Just make sure that you put your fire in the dead center of it. And just make sure that you're not going to end up accidentally setting the forest on fire, right? Like I say, I do try to harvest off the dead as much as possible. That one looks fairly straight. And you don't have to be overly picky when you're doing the tripods to get every little twig and branch off because when it's set up as a tripod these become little pot hangers and stuff where you can hook utensils or pots or whatever else onto so you don't have to you know clean these and get them absolutely perfect in fact it's better not to So like I say, I'm just going to go through and clean up three of these. I got two. So like I say, I've got my three cut now. Make my tripod with. One of the good parts about harvesting the dead stuff too, as a kind of secondary gain, is the fact of in the summer months, these dead fallen trees become fire hazards. They turn bone dry and all this old dead wood just really becomes volatile and it, you know if there was ever a fire through here that stuff will just go up so it's kind of good to turn around and harvest off things like this when you're out in these areas you know just not only are you not taking down the living but you're reducing the fire risk by kind of clearing these things out and then uh, you know when they're in big piles with tinder you know fine twigs and everything strapped to them those fine twigs just become fuel to get these bigger pieces going the more you can kind of break those down and separate them and kind of get them away from each other, the less fire risk there is. So I'll end up harvesting off a bunch of these small twigs as well and use them to help get the fire going. And, uh, you know, when I come across dead trees like this, if I come back to this location, I'll just keep clearing this tree down through time more and more until there's no twigs, no branches, and then, <coughs> and then I'll start harvesting off the larger wood because I know it's been sitting dead and dry for a while. It's not ideal burn, but it's still better that I burn it than it just goes with the forest and destroys everything, right? So, either way, I've got my three pieces of wood. These are hardier now, because they're going to be carrying the weight of cooking food and that kind of thing. So, you know, you want to have these ones be a little bigger than your thumb in thickness, and make sure that they're not fragile at all, that they're good, solid pieces of wood. You know, if you bang them on the ground, if they just snap in two, they're no good, right? So that's a good way to test them. I know that this wood is all solid and secure, so I'm going to throw up the tripod. When it comes to that big dirt area that I cleared out, don't worry. I'm, even though I've pulled the moss off the top and stuff, it looks like I've done damage, if you will. Uh, tomorrow morning when I end up pulling up my camp and leaving this area, I'll take all that moss and put it back over. And in a matter of a week or two, that moss will start to settle right into the ground again, and it'll be no harm. That stuff isn't just going to all die off and be waste. So like I say, for the people that have watched these videos before, or watched my videos before, this will be old hat to you. But for the people that haven't, welcome aboard. I hope you like, share, and subscribe, and that kind of stuff. So like I say, I make loops that are just two overhand knots. They're tied as a fisherman's knot. And it's made out of 28 inches of cordage. This is standard paracord. So I take these three sticks, and I take the thin ends of the sticks, because it's always, all the sticks have fat to thin, right? So I take these, I hook them on, and I turn, I double it up on itself. 
I set that in about three or four inches or so. Then I take the middle stick and I just wind it. And I keep doing that until the paracord starts to just tensen up. It normally takes two or three windings. And then you end up with a tripod at the end of it. Looking like such. These sticks aren't the straightest, but nature has a funny version of straight, so it is what it is. But structurally speaking, sold enough to hold the food over the fire. So I'm just going to set this down on top of my fire pit area. Make sure they all kind of sit the way I want them to. And that's going to be to hang my food off of. It's a rapid way to just kind of get a tripod up and running. The thinking really will be I'm going to hang a rope or a chain from the top of that tripod and it's going to hold my cooking vessel in over the fire. So you can see this dead fallen tree has a lot of really small twigs and branches on it and these will be great for getting the fire going so I'm going to gather up a bundle of the smallest ones that are they're way smaller than even the thickness of a pencil they're closer in between the thickness of a pencil and the thickness of the pencil lead you know they're about that diameter so I'm going to harvest these but because there's been a lot of rain over the last couple weeks really up in this area everything up here is fairly moist so even though this stuff will burn as soon as it dries out, I've got the concern about the moisture that's sitting into it, and I have to address that. So I'm going to show you a little trick that I do that allows me to get some um, early in the fire kindling, if you will, that is dry even if you're in wet conditions. I gathered up a, there's a couple bigger ones in there that are closer to the size of a pencil, but I gathered up a half decent pile of these really tiny sticks but I'm still concerned given the amount of rain and stuff so I'm gonna have to kind of do something that takes it to the next level I have to gather up a bundle of larger sticks as well that's maybe one and a half two times the size of that and I'm gonna have those um, broken into pieces that are about a foot and a half two foot in length or so but let me show you that trick now Okay, well as we all know, it's back to school season. So I've got a little pencil sharpener that has kind of an enclosed case. You know, standard stuff like you send your kids back to school with and that kind of thing. So under that premise though, what I plan on doing is I'm gonna go and find you know one of the dead trees that are in this area where there's a branch that's floating off the ground. So I know that it's not in any type of direct contact with the moisture of the earth. I'm going to debark that and then I'm going to send the wood through the pencil sharpener to get dry clean shavings that I can then use to help aid the fire. It really helps bat down any moisture that might be in the wood because you're not taking the surface of the wood, you're only going to harvest the inside of those pieces. So let me cut back in a minute and I'll show you that. I've got some really dead branches and one of the easy ways to tell is I'm going to take this branch and if it snaps really easy, that tells me that this is old, it's dead, there's not a lot of life in it. If it's got a lot of resistance when you try to snap these, that means there's still some green to it and it's not going to be quite as dry. So the thinking really is I'm going to turn around and remove all this outer bark and I'll use the back of my knife if I have to, or the back of my saw. In fact, I'll just do the back of my saw now because it's readily available and I'm just going to want to walk up that and clear off all the outer layer of this piece of wood and you can see it's already the size of a pencil roughly all that outer bark is going to do for one it doesn't burn that great and for two it's got moisture into it so by removing it it helps you get back down to the dry wood that would be inside and that's really the core of what we're after is we don't want any of the moisture, we just want dry wood. 
So I'm going to run this through the pencil sharpener and create a bunch of pencil shavings. And then when I use that with the cedar bark we harvested earlier, it'll ensure that we get the fire going a lot easier because of the moist in these twigs and things around. So like I say, I just then put the twig into the pencil sharpener and just start giving her. Let the pencil sharpener make those fine shavings for me. And because it's in this kind of plastic container, it'll help keep them in. Of course, as soon as you say that, there's an escapee, right? But uh, I recommend getting the one that has the large and the small. And that way, if you do come across larger pieces of twigs, you know, they'll fit into there as well. But that's really the thinking. Uh, into, into that container now, I'm going to gather up a whole bed of fine shavings. And these shavings should be really dry. So when I get the uh, red cedar going, now I'll add these on top of it as soon as the red cedar kind of goes to flame. These should take really easily and that should give me enough strength to ensure that those small twigs that I've got sitting over in the tripod area, that they'll go even if they're moist. Okay, so I just used my tarp bag to kind of let it stand out a bit better. But as you can see, now I made these kind of fine shavings. You got lots of surface area on them out of dry wood. I put it on there because I had filled up the pencil sharpener little catch it has on there. They filled that up two or three times and uh, you know I had to have somewhere to dump it so I just put it onto there. But uh, it gives you an idea. So the thinking really is like I say that stuff should be dry and easily combustible as soon as flame hits it. So having the red cedar bark take the flame and then hopefully pass it on to this with ease to then take any moisture, this should buy the minute or two flame that I need to drive any moisture out of that fine twigs and branches that are there. So when it comes to my larger sticks, I could harvest off that deadfall, and I have a little bit, but it's really, the wood's very, almost punky. But a lot of the trees have kind of dead branches that grow off them in this area, where when you snap them, they just come off with ease. So any ones that kind of snap off easily, I'll take those as larger branches and they form my larger twig pile. So this forest is full of them. I could harvest large sticks for days with ease. So I'm just gonna go grab a pile of those. Oh, hey, that's cool. A little nook. See the little things you find, very cool. Anyways, so I'm going to harvest off a pile of the larger sticks and get ready for my fire. The sun's going to be gone soon, so I'm going to have to start to really hustle here. As we move later into the season and we get closer to wintertime, you start losing sun hours in the location I'm in. I'm up in Canada, so the sun goes down fast here. <laughs> you know, and the further north you go, the faster it goes in the wintertime. So one way or the other, I've got to start to kind of just harvest my sticks and that kind of stuff, get that together, and uh, get my fire going. Okay, so as you can see, started to build up a large sticks pile and kind of fattened out the smaller twigs pile with anything that was attached to the large sticks. I almost forgot, I gotta get the uh, hanger so I can hang the pot over the fire. I'm not gonna do the grill with the chain this time, even though that's my preferred method. Um, I only plan on boiling off water. I think I've got a hot and sour soup or something or and some chow mein or something. You just add hot water to them. But I'm going to be having that for dinner. I can't remember which one I grabbed. So I'm just going to take a, yet again one of my six to eight foot hanks of rope. And I'm just going to hook this onto the top of the tripod and feed the tag end through the eye or the loop, if you will. Wrap that around a couple times. And the thinking really is, I just need a small stick, so I'll just take one of the ones I'm going to do the fire with. Get all the bark off it, because I don't want any of that in uh, any of my stuff. I tend to remove the bark because there's bacterium and stuff that live on the bark, but aren't necessarily as prevalent on the surface of the wood itself. So by doing that, it's just now to safety. So all I'm going to do now is right down near the bottom, I'm going to make a marlin spike it. So I make a loop, I lift that loop up, 
I reach through, grab the main line that's coming through from the top of the tripod, I open it up, I stick my stick through, and I cinch it down. Now my pot has a bale handle on it. It'll allow me to hook this onto the bale handle of the pot, and that way I can hang the pot over the fire. And then when I want to raise and lower it, I simply just wrap the paracord around the top a few times, and now it can be raised up. So I'll just cut scenes and pull my pot out of the bag and hang that on there so you can see exactly what that'll look like. See that Marlin spike hitch with the stick on it. I just simply put that through, and bang, I can hang my pot easy enough. And then I can just raise and lower that into the fire by releasing some of the tension. You can bring it right down to the ground and just bring it up to whatever height I want it to be at. So it's a simple way. I don't normally like doing this method. It's simple and it's, you know, I got the materials that are readily available to do it. But what I find is even though the paracord doesn't uh, burn altogether, it ends up, the heat normally ends up scorching the paracord and gives the paracord kind of a hard outer shell, which I don't really like. So when it comes to using that paracord later on, I'm always leery about using it for anything structural. Okay, so let's get this fire going, shall we? Oh, had to put the knee pads on. So like I say, I've got my red cedar that I harvested earlier in the video. I've got that sitting on top of a bed of little sticks and that's really just to ensure that I'm not doing this all directly on the moisture of the earth. So I shifted over the shavings that I got off the pencil sharpener and just put them in my hat and that way it was easier for me to kind of move it around if I needed to. I'm just getting access to the back of my, well, of course, I'm just getting access to the back of my saw blade. Saw blades and the pocket knives are done with a different type of steel. It's normally a high carbon steel that they use in the saws. So they're more ideal for throwing a spark off of a fair rod than any other piece you'd normally have in your... Sorry, I just chipped a nail there. But they're normally more ideal, that, that type of metal is normally more ideal for throwing sparks off a of fair rod. Okay, so the cedar's going. Now those fine shavings I did off the pencil sharpener, I'm going to set those on there. You can see the moisture didn't want to get it going. So now I'm going to just use a...
got to get these smaller sticks burning. That's the critical point, right? They have to be able to take and hold flame. And like I say, from the amount of rain, it makes it really difficult. So I'm just going to, they're starting to just take it now. I'm just going to let that sit and build now. I'm not going to play around with it too much. I want the heat to just kind of work through that bundle. Now all the small twigs, I just want to get all of those going now. I can hear the moisture and you can see it in the camera, the white smoke that's coming off. That's all the moisture in this wood from all the rain. And all the twigs, everything I have has just got moisture in it. I can feel it as I touch the wood. You can feel this layer of moisture on the surface of the wood. It's not, I wouldn't call it wet, it's just got moisture in it. So the thinking really though is, I've got to try to dry out that wood as best I possibly can. smaller of the large sticks now because I know that this one's I knew this fire would be difficult given the amount of rain that's occurred so it's really just hoping that these larger sticks dry out before that smaller tinder ends up uh, exhausting itself That's really the critical component of this. The moisture has to get out of this wood. And as soon as you start getting a bit of a core to it, where it's stable, then I won't worry so much. But until I reach that point, I'm constantly leery that this uh, fire is just going to go out. But it really is just critical that we get these larger sticks burning. So you can see now, the flames are in a solid way, starting to push out past the top. So that tells me I can confidently add on more of this larger wood. And so I will. Because even in the large stuff, like I say, I can feel the moisture all through this. And really, I've got to get it up to the point where it's strong enough, and it pretty well is now. And I've got to get it up to the point where it's strong enough to be able to burn fuel wood. And then let the fuel wood sustain the fire. You notice how I'm aiming the sticks almost straight up and down as much as possible. As the heat rises, I want it to rise across that entire piece of wood. So by stacking them up that way, it just allows them to catch as much of the heat as it possibly can to dry that wood out. Okay, so as you can see, that's all of the large sticks now. And I've got them, for the better part, pointed almost straight up and down, just heating and warming. But it seems to be building down, and you'll see down in the lower part of the fire, it's starting to build like a red glow down there. That's your coal bed. You're wanting to build that base up as much as you can. When I go to throw the fuel wood on, it's that stuff down at the bottom that'll actually sustain and burn that fuel wood. All this stuff up on the top will just feed that bed of embers. Or sorry, bed of coals. Oh, my memory did serve me right. I grabbed the hot and spicy. I thought I'd grab the chow mein for a minute, but oh well, either way. So I got chicken salad, uh, pre-packaged stuff. Comes with some uh, comes with some crackers and stuff. I don't even have to cook that stuff. But I just need to boil off a bit of water for this hot and spicy soup. I think it's chicken flavor. But so one way or the other, when the fire starts to kind of calm down, 
and then build up its uh, coal base. I'll get my fuel wood on and then start boiling the water. So hey there fellow YouTubers, Frank Bush here again. So thanks for tuning in to another one of my bushcraft adventures. Uh, as you can see I've got the bale pot now hanging over the fire trying to get the water to a boil. I'm hungry, I want to get some dinner into me. But I hope you enjoyed this uh, tarp shelter setup. You know, I like the reality that you can open and close the doors easily. It's versatile in that regard. You know, and to have a ground sheet in built into it out of a 10 by 10 tarp makes it really handy. You know, it's not quite as large as, say, the trapezoidal pyramid shelter that I've done in previous videos. You now you can really pack the bodies in that one, but it doesn't have a ground sheet, and uh, the door's a little more awkward to open and close in that regard. So this one's good for if you wanted to do, you know, lightweight, you only want to pack a single tarp, that you're just a person by themselves, you want to have ease of being able to open and close doors and that kind of stuff, this shelter's great for that. You know, but if you enjoy this type of content, please like, share, and subscribe, and thanks for watching. Cheers.